Click the, 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 the. Okay. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me, for giving me the opportunity here. I will talk about active matter. Basically, it is friction but it is friction between fluid and solid, as we heard this morning, and sometimes also between fluid and fluid. Um, let me start with a movie, and I hope it will work. Okay. This is an island where uh, Impala is trapped, and there is a croc waiting for the impala and swimming, hunting it. And you see, the croc is faster than the impala, and I cut the video here, since there is a bitter end. <laughs> so it matters how fast you can swim. Yeah? Maybe, maybe again then. So the croc is in the back, it decides to jump, there's no other option, but then in the water, I mean, the croc is overtaking and approaching its prey. So, this happens also in the micro world. This is a micron sized uh, white blood cell following the bacterium, which you see, and it now swallows it. That's it. That's the end of it. Okay. So, the conclusion is. The swimming speed matters, and if the swimming speed matters, friction plays a role. Yeah? If you swim in a superfluid, I don't know how to do this, but uh, it makes a difference than if you swim in honey or in water. And it depends on a lot of things, your shape, but in particular also the propulsion force and also the technique to swim. And this is, I think, a pretty new research field also now in physics. If you go to the micron scale here, and then, if you estimate what is the typical number, say, the typical Reynolds number, uh, a Reynolds number is the ratio between inertial forces and viscous forces, then viscous forces, you are in a viscous liquid, are very, very large relative to inertial forces. And this has to do not only with the fact that ether, the shear viscosity of the solvent is large, but in particular, that's the typical length scale of the swimming object, L, is very small. Uh, this is in the enumerator, L, and eta is in the um, denominator. Small means, in this case, that if you go to micrometers, uh, the Reynolds number is 10 to minus 6, yeah, or 10 to minus 4, so it is practically zero. Yeah? While for, say, a human body, if you swim in a swimming pool, the Reynolds number is of the order of one or larger, and for a racing car, it is even much larger. So, if you look how bacteria swim, they swim 100 times their body length in one second, while a human only swims, if you are a good swimmer, 1.5 times your body length in one second. So bacteria manage, if you believe this is a fair comparison, for body length, uh, bacteria uh, manage to swim very uh, quickly. And also the technique of swimming is completely different. Humans, if you are in your swimming pool, you do one breaststroke, yeah? and then you are gliding. It's inertia which drives you forward. Well, this doesn't work for bacteria. They swim at low Reynolds number and need another technique. And here is a famous theorem, yeah? so-called scallop theorem. This is a, a model of a scallop. Yeah? It's a, a, a scallop if it just does this and then goes back. Yeah? It works in water for a macroscopic scallop. Yeah? 
This is a way to propel. But if you go to a very viscous liquid or to very small sizes, at low Reynolds number, it doesn't work any longer. What you do is you move forward, and then if you open up again, you move backwards. So you just do this. This is not good if you want to escape a predator. Yeah? You, you want to move. So bacteria, some of them at least, typically have corkscrew flagella in the back, and they are rotating this corkscrews. And this means that the motion of the flagellum is non-reciprocal in time. What do I mean by non-reciprocal in time? Non-reciprocal in time means if you mirror the time, so if time goes in minus time, the uh, motion is not the same as before. For a scallop, if you mirror the time, it's always the same. For a rotating helix, if you mirror time, it goes the other way around. Clockwise goes into clockwise, anti-clockwise, and so uh, it's not the same. And that's one of the reasons why this bacteria swim very efficiently. Now there's a new development in the last decades where you say, I don't want to use mechanical motion of my limbs or whatever, of my body. And this is difficult for micro nanoparticles anyway, since what you should do to mimic mechanical motion is do little robots. Yeah? They do motion like, like this. This is not so easy. But there are better and more efficient techniques to self-propel, to swim in a solvent. And this is how it works. The particles themselves generate a gradient of something. I will give you an example later. And then they move autonomously along this gradient, since you have a non-equilibrium situation. And these are, brings you to the picture of artificial model microstimmers. And these are dominated by dissipation, since you are always at low Reynolds number, and by friction. Here's, I say, our working course now for such an artificial colloidal microswimmer. It is a Janus particle. The Janus is a Roman god who had two faces. So you have, a, say, a colloidal sphere, micrometer sphere, and you put a metallic coating on half of it. So there is a cap. Uh, in this case gold, and uh, say a non-metallic other part. And then it's micrometer size, several micrometers, and then you put it, that's the uh, one idea, you put it into a reactive solvent. Of course, if you put a Janus particle in an inert solvent, it will just perform Brownian motion. There's nothing it will do else. But if you catalyze a chemical reaction at one of the surfaces, say, a, for example, it's a gold part, then uh, something goes on on one side, which is missing on the other side, and you get an imbalance of the situation, an imbalance of forces, and thus that drives the particle. And in this case, you use a decomposition of H2O2 into water and oxygen, and at one side, in here, uh, we have platinum gold rods. It's a platinum side, you have oxygen, that is uh, uh, produced, so you have little bubbles yeah, from the chemical reaction, and these bubbles more or less drive the particle to one side. The, actually, the, the mechanism is not understood completely, even today, but you can move these particles. So you have little submarines on the micrometer scale which move on their own. Yeah? You don't have to, say, beat them from the outside. They do it on their own, so they are autonomously swimming or self-propelled particles. One disadvantage here is you are running out of fuel, yeah, since at a certain time after two hours, the amount of uh, H2O2 is exhausted, so there is no fuel any longer, and the particle gets slower and slower and stops. How can you get out of this fuel limitation? Okay, here's another, I think, very ingenious example that you use laser illumination to get particles running forever. And the idea is to use a non-equilibrium phase change, a fluid-fluid demixing in the solvent, and then you throw the particles into that and heat them very, very little bit up. The idea is uh, here in this phase diagram. Um, it is now a very good idea to use a certain mixture. It's water and lutidine. Lutidine is stinking a lot. 
but at least it has a lower critical point at about room temperature, and that's what you take advantage out of. So at about 30 degrees, there is a phase separation from A to B. If you are in A at low temperatures, there's one phase, a homogeneous phase. If you go to B, if you heat a little bit, the system phase separates into a lutidine pool and a lutidine-rich uh, fluid. Now look at this picture, uh, bottom left. You take such a Janus particle in a mixture, and you laser illuminate, and then the metallic part heats up a little bit. It's getting warmer there. Yeah? since the heat is adsorbed. And then locally, you go from A to B in the phase diagram, which means, yeah, you generate wetting. You go into the two-phase region. So, which means that the lutidine, there's more lutidine in the metallic surface than uh, in front of the particle. And this brings the solvent into flow, and this makes the particle propagating on its own. That's, that's the idea, and it works, and you can let the particles run forever, basically. Here are some more details. I mean, uh, in this uh, picture below, the laser intensity is shown, so it's, it's not much. It's microwatt per micrometer squared. And if you exceed a certain threshold, I not, yeah, you bring the particle into motion, and the particle velocity approximately scales linearly with the laser intensity. So you can now, at which, control your motion. High laser intensity, particle goes, low laser, laser intensity, it stops, and so on and so on. So this is uh, one of those, as I said, working courses where many experiments by now have been performed, mainly in the group of Clemens Bechinger, who is now in Constance, and here is a review article on all this physics of active matter, active colloidal particles. In particular, what you have to take into account are uh, fluctuations. So these particles are still Brownian, and uh, here's just an idea of what can be uh, artificially done and also what is found in nature for, for real bacteria, sperm, E. coli, and so on. Now I would like to bring a little bit of theory to your attention, how this idea of self-propulsion and friction and also the fluctuations are important. Now, we are at the micron scale, so fluctuations are important, and you don't want to be killed by the fluctuations, huh? so you want to go on your own. And the simplest model which brings all this about, so self-propulsion, friction, and also fluctuations, is a so-called active Brownian motion, active Brownian particles. And the equations of motion are shown here in this first block. There's a force, say, equilibrium and a torque equilibrium. Let's first talk about the force equilibrium, you are normally expecting a mass times acceleration term first. This is zero since we are at low Reynolds number. Then everything is dominated by friction, so we have friction constant times velocity, and that's equal to, uh, first of all, a fluctuation force, that's the right-hand side, F of T, but also an internal force, that is the important one, the red one, which scales with the self-propulsion velocity and is directed along the particle, say, Janus caps. And this orientational degree of freedom in two dimension is uh, fluctuating with orientational noise. So you have Gau Gaussian noise for the translation. This is F of T. You have Gaussian noise for the rotation. That is the random torque. That is G of T. And these equations are coupled via the self-propulsion term. No? And if there is no V0, if there is no self-propulsion, we are back to ordinary Brownian motion that was solved by Einstein many years ago. And what it basically says, these equations, is you have not any longer a random walk. Yeah? A Brownian particle is a random walk. So you go to the left, and then you don't remember, and you go somewhere else to the right, right, left, left, and then you know all, on average, your mean square displacement doesn't scale with time squared, but just with time, that is diffusion. Right? The mean square displacement scales with time. But what you have here is something like a random drive. So remember, you have a car, and the driver is blind, and it steers, yeah? it, is, it has a steering wheel, and it has random fluctuations in the orientation where to go, and it goes at very high speed. Yeah? This is a dangerous concept. So you go with your car very quickly, and you have random orientational Motion. This is what people call a persistent random walk. Uh, you remember where you came from, why is the orientation degree of freedom, and you may also call it a random drive. 
So in this active Brownian motion model, you can calculate the mean displacement uh, is zero, but the mean square displacement you can calculate. This is in this formula, and if you do a log-log plot of the mean squared displacement, you see for small times it's linear in time, that is translational diffusion. For long times, it's diffusive again, since you go on average, yeah, randomly. But intermittently, for an intermediate time, you have ballistic motion, and this reflects the fact that you have your velocity v not at work. And the diffusion coefficient for long times scales as v not squared over 4 d rot. It's much, much larger than translational diffusion. So you can significantly enhance the diffusive motion, and that is what bacteria actually do if they are searching for food. Yeah? They want to know where is something which I can find there. Explore, say, the region much more efficiently than a stupid Brownian particle that is not self-propelled. Ah, so good. So now I'm going one step further and studying many particles, many Janus particles which are interacting and uh, we have done, we have done uh, simulations with a pairwise potential, in this case a WCA potential, but we have also, I should say this at this conference, done simulations with a Yukawa potential, maybe to honor Mark Robbins, who did fundamental studies on the Yukawa many body systems with Kurt Kremer and, and Crest. Uh, it's an important paper on the phase diagram, which we also used to calculate activity effects here. But anyway, Many particles, classical particles, they are all self-propelled and they are interacting via a potential that is not aligning. So the, the particles just bump into each other. Yeah? They don't align. And there is a dimensionless parameter, the so-called Peckley number, that measures, say, KBT, the fluctuations over the systematic energy which you get via friction. And if this is small, you have equilibrium effects. If this is large, the system is dominated by self-propulsion. And there is a new effect that you don't know from equilibrium physics, and this is now called a MIPS, motility-induced phase separation. And let me briefly explain what, how it comes from. Suppose you have all these particles moving, and there is a triplet collision, like a Mercedes star configuration in B here. Three particles are opposing each other in the self-propulsion, and then they are blocked. And they are blocked for a long time until a fortunate rotational motion brings one particle out of this, say, blockade effect, and it can escape. And now there is a competition between two effects. It, the time it takes to deliberate yourself from this blocking configuration goes with one over the rotational diffusion. That's the typical time you need to rotate. But in this time, other particles can come and collide with the cluster and make it larger and more immobile. And this is a traveling time, which scales with the particle density and also with the self-propulsion. And if you put these two timescales equal, there must be, say, a fundamentally different behavior. Yeah? If particles can become free, there will be no clusters. If particles cannot become free, what is going on? Stop or continue? Yeah, okay. okay. And that's actually what happens. And here I show you uh, two movies. No movies, but <laughs> in the low Peckley number case, particles will form clusters transiently, but these particles will dissolve, while in the high Peckley number case, it's on the right-hand side, there will be in the end one big system-spanning cluster, and that is seen in the experiments and in the simulations. I will try to get at least one movie running. No, no way. Everything is crashed. Ah, okay. <laughs> Imagine. 
So you can work it out, you can work it out with the field theory, you get a critical point, the question is are the exponents classical, easing-like or not, you can find analogies to thermodynamic phase transitions, beautiful, so that's MIPS and that's not for, for uh, passive systems, since for passive systems, you know, once you have repulsive interaction, there's never a fluid-fluid demixing, there is a critical point only comes from attraction. How much time? Ten minutes, very good. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go a little bit up in Reynolds number again. So, up to now we had inertial and viscous effects, went down to very small sizes, so 10 to minus 6, where we could neglect all the inertial effects and ended up with fluctuations and viscous effects alone, so friction and fluctuations. Now we go a little bit up, and then we keep the term which is proportional to inertia. This is mesoscale active matter, and it is the, the model is now called active Langevin motion. And you have, if you have look at these different organisms, you have scales where bacteria and cells are moving on the left-hand side, but then there is a mesoscale regime where little animals, like flies and little fish and bees, are experiencing, uh, say, inertial effects up to very macroscopic scales where inertia is dominating. So I will now go back a little bit on the inertial effects and how to generalize uh, the equations is pretty clear now, is I include in the red box here uh, inertia in for both translation and rotation, and then the equations are more complicated. Yeah. Same kind of noise that you could even introduce a systematic torque M here, which brings a particle in a systematic rotation. This is a circle swimmer, but I will not go into this. So now we go from a micro swimmer to a micro flyer. Now you are moving in, say, in a gas uh, phase. And there are several time scales, and I cannot explain them in the remaining 10 or 9 minutes, but I just say, well, the important time scale is a persistence time again, so that's the time upon which the particle loses memory, and there is a translational momentum relaxation time, dd, tau d, that is mass over friction, and if this is zero, the momentum are immediately relaxed, if this is large, the momentum are very slowly relaxed, and the same for the rotational degrees of freedom. So what you can do in this model is calculate the long time diffusion again. Again, you have something like a random drive, yeah, but now you have inertia, and you end up again with a formula that scales with V naught squared over T d rot, and there is a scaling function that you can calculate However, it is a lower incomplete gamma function and something, a combination of that, it is not, say, standard. And interestingly, for passive underdamped motion, this long time diffusion constant does not depend on the mass and on J, yeah? but it does so if you include activity. It does not depend on mass, but it dep depends on a J, so on the, on the moment of inertia. And here are the high J and low J expansions of this. And again, what matters is persistence. Since a moment of inertia also makes the rotational motion slower, it slows it down. So you keep longer your memory, and that's what brings you forward in terms of uh, diffusion. And now there is another inertial effect, and maybe the movie works, I don't know. It should be a very nice movie. It's a very, very nice movie, and you can... Yes. Uh, if you tell a racing car driver to move along the corner, uh, to make a curve, he, he or she exactly knows what to do. First turn the steering wheel, uh, and then inertia will hinder the rotation, but later on it will win and you go around the corner. So first you steer your wheel, and then the velocity follows. That's what a racing car driver does. And you can also see this in the inertial swimmers. By defining a correlation function, it's now a dynamical correlation function. I correlate, I don't know, can you see the model? The velocity after a time t with the orientation before a time t, and you interchange the time arguments and subtract two things. So if they are completely uncorrelated, this is zero. But if this is positive, it means that first your 
orientation changes, and then the velocity follows. This we call inertial delay. This correlation function has a peak at a, say, certain time, and the amplitude shows you the effect of inertial delay. And here's an analytical formula. You can work this out completely, and you can test it. We have tested this against, uh, also against data of swimming beetles. So the beetles, the predatory beetles, uh, swimming at the water interface, and they exhibit also this kind of inertial delay effect. And you can, you can do here a couple of other papers which have to do with mass ejection or injection and active uh, motion. How to, how to uh, say, realize that? Swimming beetles, but also there is uh, here a dusty plasma. A dusty plasma are basically micron-sized spheres, but not embedded in a liquid, but in a plasma, so in a gas. And their inertial effects play an important role, and there are now first experiments for Janus particles in a plasma that confirm basically these equations. Now, in my last minutes, I would like to tell you what happens with this MIPS, yeah? motility-induced phase separation, this Mercedes star collisions, if you have inertia. I normally, you know, uh, uh, if you change a parameter, in 95% the result is, is boring, the expected one. But in this case, it wasn't. I would like to <laughs> tell this story to you now. So the equations of motion are clear, so we take this uh, interaction potential, uh, Java or WSA doesn't matter, repulsive in any case. And then uh, we write down the active Langevin equations with the self-propulsion velocity we not here. And what about uh, MIPS? With, with Suvendo Mandal and Benno Liebchen in this uh, paper here, we obtained several effects. First of all, inertia destroys MIPS. Third, the cluster growth exponent is smaller than one third, which it is normal, uh, normal, normally for um, active Brownian motion. So inertia changes the exponents. But what you also see is you have a coexistence of two phases with two different kinetic temperatures. And that is surprising. Since you learn in thermodynamics, if you have phase coexistence, phase A here and phase B here, the temperatures should be the same since if they wouldn't be the same, there is heat flow. Uh, as long uh, this uh, temperatures, so long as the temperatures are compensated and they are equal. This is not the case in uh, this non-equilibrium situation. And here is hopefully a movie which works. I describe in words uh, that you have an initially homogeneous system. Temperature, kinetic temperature is homogeneous, and density is homogeneous, and then spontaneously you get a region which becomes very cold and another region which stays hot. And the, where it is very cold, the particle density is very high. That's, that's the idea. And the idea is that... Uh, That's a, here, here's a snapshot, here's a snapshot, the end state point of the movie that you get, say, a temperature inside which is very, very small, and the density that is shown here is very high. So the idea is that in the dense phase there are so many collisions that the particles cannot accelerate to obtain their terminal velocity V0, but they can do so in the gas. Now we can think about this is crazy, so we have put forward an idea of a, say, active refrigerator, a fridge, which uses this effect, so it cools self, it does self-cooling, as a, say, not as a heating, but as a cooling machine. And uh, there is also, there's also uh, the fundamental question, now can we describe this? I mean, there is no theory up to now, these are just simulation data, and this is something which uh, brings me to an end. So here is again the, the mechanism. So in the gas phase, particles accelerate. There are only few collisions until they have this velocity V0, while here they cannot do so. They are so much jammed that they are completely uh, cold. And here is a, a simulation data for the growth exponent of the dense cluster 
and you see that the dose exponent significantly changes from one third over to one over five. Um, time, so I jump. are that self-propelled colloidal Llanos particles show fascinating single and collective phenomena dominated by friction. Thank you very much for your attention. Much the uh, questions a lot, I think. We start with uh, you, Ben. Very nice talk. I just wanted to ask what prevents the continuous aggregation in the case of uh, self-rotating particles? <laughs> Is something related to centrifugal effects like in the meteorites that Bob Persson showed before? What limits the aggregation of, into the clusterization of these uh, self-rotating particles? Okay, if I understood correct, I mean, in the end state is one big cluster. So one phase separated bulky part of dense system. And what limits it is the prescribed density. Uh, you impose the density. If you have a very, very large system, you have a density, and then this, this dictates the, the portion of dense phase. If that was the question. So it's like in thermodynamics. Very nice talk. Um, do the Janus particles, when they flow, create um, a flow in the liquid afterwards so that you get correlations between the Janus particles? Oh, yes. So very, very important and very interesting question. They do. Yeah. There is a hydrodynamic flow field. And one should take this into account if you have, say, dense suspensions. Uh, people here discriminate between pushers and pullers. So if you, if you push the liquid, so if you do it with your legs, you are, you are a pusher. And if you do breaststrokes, you are a puller, so you pull the liquids. These are two different hydrodynamic flow fields. And actually, what we did for the MIPS, we neglected all this. But if you take it into account, and it's an important effect for dense suspensions. And it works normally against MIPS. It doesn't want particles to have close to each other, so they are repulsive. But it's, it's a real subtle thing and can also be measured. Yeah, thank you. One quick educational question. Um, so the Reynolds number does not depend on the slip length or on the liquid solid friction, right? It's, it's just viscosity and size. It is just viscosity, so we assume that the slip length is much smaller than the body size. And that's always, even if you start including you inertial the effects. the scale, it is questionable. Okay. Yes, but for micro-sized particles in normal solvents, that's fine. Like that. So but yeah, there's only one length scale here. So okay. No oh, important point. Yeah. And you want to see an experiment? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I get if I get one minute to talk about that, <laughs> we have an experiment in our cellar. So I'm in an institute of theoretical physics, but we have a vibrating plate where you put little plastic animals, granules, on, and then they move. And they are dominated by inertia. And they are... Find that they stuck. We hope to find or are beginning yeah. to find okay. this effect in an experiment. Okay, the, the real new trend that is that uh, theorists are becoming experimentalists. Yes. So this is really what we should... Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. We proceed with the... Next